And here we are. Hey, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> ah, this works. Hi, right, good to see you, John. How are you? I'm well. If it's uh, Thursday, it must be intersections. That is what Thursdays have now become known as, is Intersections Day, uh, where not just you and I, but the whole community jams together <laughs> in, in intellectual discourse and, and uh, artistic jamming. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode. It's fantastic to be here with you today. I think we'll just jump right in because we're going to be tight on time and our first guest is already backstage. So I'll give the the, the grand introduction uh, and then we'll kick things off. So welcome to <laughs> Intersections, a weekly conversational jam session that dives deep into the intersections among technology, innovation, culture, and ideas. We bring diverse personalities and worldviews together in the service of greater understanding and unlearning. We also bring diverse personalities and wor worldviews together with you. Uh, so we definitely want to hear from you as we are sharing our ideas, as we're talking to our guests. Let us know where you're watching or tuning in from. Let us know if you have observations or ideas or thoughts uh, since the last week or just what's on your mind. Uh, share with us questions for guests and we'll do our best to share all of them on screen and, and even try to answer, uh, answer a few. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to introduce my amazing co-host and friend, John Kao. Uh, the Economist has called him Mr. Creativity. What Could you imagine The Economist calling you Mr. Creativity? That is pretty cool. Uh, and a serial innovator. Uh, he's a thought leader, entrepreneur, and advisor who has played a prominent role in the fields of innovation and business creativity for over 30 years. And in, in many ways, he's literally wrote the book uh, and he's taught the courses. He's taught at Harvard Business School and he's also served as visiting faculty at the MIT Media Lab and Stanford. But uh, also, if you were to spend any time in this, uh, this man's loft in San Francisco, this massive space with three grand pianos in his living room, uh, you would not be surprised to learn that he's a Tony nominated producer of film and stage. And he also wrote the best selling book. Jamming the Art and Discipline of Business Creativity. Mr. Kea, welcome to Intersections. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Well, you know, guitar players get to have multiple guitars because, uh, <laughs> you know, a Flying V is different from a Stratocaster, is different from, a, you know, an acoustic. Uh, and it's the same thing with pianos. You know, pianos this is true. Cool, so uh, why not have a few, you know? <laughs> That's a whole nother, uh, whole nother story. <laughs> But let me uh, reciprocate because uh, Brian's my uh, innovation twin and we are uh, each motivated by a common interest and obsession really in trying to unpeel the onion of innovation and uh, trying to situate it properly in uh, the world as it exists today because the old ideas don't cut it and the new ideas have yet to be invented and we're kind of dancing on that edge. Uh, Brian's been dancing on the edge for three decades uh, involved with Matters Digital before digital was a thing and relating digital to marketing and to communication, social media, uh, and you know how, how we as organizations need to uh, function differently in a digital environment, which is one of the big subtexts of our uh, show. Uh, he's been a, a, a keynote speaker, a best-selling author, uh, someone who pumps out an enormous amount of intellectual capital. And I urge you to follow him on uh, social media because uh, once a week isn't enough to really get a sense of what Brian is all about. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to be co-hosting the show with him. Oh, well, thank you, John. Uh, I'm, I, it's, it's just, uh, it's just one of the highlights of my week. Uh, and I always leave every episode smarter, wiser, and, and, and also more humble. Uh, I do want to say hello to a special guest, Chef Lizette, who's someone that I've been connected with for several years. She's probably one of the hardest, uh, working entrepreneurial chefs that I know and, and creating, uh, all kinds of new business experiences and opportunities out there. Uh, she sets the standard for what, uh, entrepreneurialism should look like. So thank you, Chef Lizette, for being on with us. Uh, and with that said, you know, please do uh, tune in uh, or chime in. Let us know where you're where you're calling in from or watching from and also to share your questions. Now, with that, I'm just going to bring my colleague here, my Salesforce colleague, Marty Kine up. Marty, I'm going to uh, before uh, I, I jump into questions for you, I am going to uh, actually give give a formal introduction. Let's see if I can. I'm also producing some multitasking here, and very nice. We'll, we'll see, see how well I do. 
me with this. Uh, so uh, Marty is uh, my colleague at Salesforce. He's the uh, Senior Vice President of Market Strategy for Salesforce Marketing Cloud. He guides the planning for the next generation of solutions for the number one marketing cloud. Uh, but before that, he was also uh, an, uh, an analyst at Gartner. He's an award-winning analyst, I should say. Uh, he's also an author. Uh, I'm gonna. I hope. Hopefully, this doesn't uh, doesn't take away too far from our conversation. But Marty and I were doing a very cool Twitter Spaces uh, recently, and there was a very cool fact uh, about him that I just wanted to share with everybody else. And John, I think you'll get a kick out of this too. Uh, so, M Marty wrote a book called House of Lies. Uh, and for those who might, uh, that might sound familiar, it has become a very popular show. Uh, I think, is it on Showtime, Marty? Showtime, yeah. Uh, yeah, so can you just quickly, and then we'll jump into the real stuff, I promise. I just love this about you. I think this is so cool uh, about how this, this, uh, this whole House of Lies uh, narrative chapter in your life came to be. Well, it was after business school. So I, I was a writer for MTV. I wrote for pop-up video. And I thought, well, I've reached the apex of life, so I might as well just go to business school. <laughs> so I went to business school, and I uh, came out, and I wanted to be a management consultant because I didn't want to work on Wall Street. So that was the other choice. And uh, I became a consultant, and I was a very unhappy, miserable, disgruntled consultant. But I was writing a book on the side, and uh, it was a dictionary, Consulting to English because consultants talk funny, you know, they don't really speak English. That's how they make so, and it turned into a memoir, <laughs> and then the memoir became a business book, and the business book over a number of years was uh, picked up by a producer, and then it turned into a show on Showtime, and the character was named Marty Kahn. It's sort of, I'm Marty Kine, that's how you pronounce my name. And Don Cheadle played him, and uh, if you've seen the show, I always say it's very, very loosely based on me, as you can probably already tell. <laughs> That's so cool. And I actually, and I, I forgot to mention uh, that you used to be a writer on Pop Up Video. Uh, I'll I'll be dating myself a little bit here, but that was actually one of my favorite shows. It was so clever uh, in how Thank you. Thank it you. brought uh, music <laughs> music and artists to life in ways that you know I I don't know. I just miss I miss that show. And actually, I want a pop up video for all kinds of aspects of daily interactions. So maybe, uh, maybe yeah, we right can for a comeback. That. Yeah, it was, it was the video was the, it was the content and then we would just have bubbles on top of it. And it, it was a lot of work. They were all true. I mean, it was all facts, but you know, that's your, uh, your book on uh, consulting probably needs to be updated because we're in this new era of consulting. I, I recently, somebody said to me, what happens if you combine uh, innovation with management consulting and you get uh, insulting? <laughs> <laughs> Management insulting. <laughs> well, they need that sometimes. Uh, John, I'm going to borrow that. I like that a lot. Uh, Marty, one of the things that we can work on together is uh, maybe bringing uh, the world of augmented reality uh, in pop-up videos just to everyday life. So like facts will pop up above our heads or above buildings or above businesses. There's something there. There is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll get on it right away. So with that said, uh, Marty, let's just jump into this. And uh, the way that this works is I'll probably ask a few questions and then turn it over to John. And uh, we should have you uh, uh, out of here by, what do you think, 2.30, John? <laughs> 30. 5 30 whatever you guys want. I'm here for you. <laughs> so John, why don't, uh, or John, uh, Marty, why don't you talk to us a little bit about your role at Salesforce, and uh, then I'll jump into some more specific questions about the state and future of marketing. Yeah, sure, happy to. Well, I was at Gartner, so I was covering marketing clouds. I was an industry analyst, and Gartner is syndicate research, and and um, I was covering the marketing clouds. I thought that was very interesting. That included Salesforce and Salesforce's competitors. Uh, at, at a one time, there were more marketing clouds. There aren't very many left, but. At any rate, uh, there was a category that appeared right toward the end of my tenure. This would have been 2018 when everyone was talking about customer data platform. We need a customer data platform. I need it for CDP for short. And as an analyst, I was very interested in this because I thought, well, what, what is this? Did this come out of nowhere? Did someone go into a basement somewhere and invent a new category of technology? And what does it do? What was this problem that no one knew they had that's now being solved? And so it became, you know, a 
an area of research for me. A lot of customers or clients of ours at, at Gartner would call up and say, what is this thing called a CDP? Do I need one? Who has one? And that was what I was hired on basically at Salesforce to do, to answer that question. Uh, do, do we have one? Should we acquire one? What What is the, this need that marketers are having in particular that this new category is trying to solve? And then uh, over since that time, it's only kind of exploded in popularity. There are over 140 vendors now that sign up with the Customer Data Platform Institute calling themselves CDP. Salesforce launched one, built one and launched one. And I continue to be a student of it and actually co-author of this book, Customer Data Platforms, which will be a Showtime series. I have no doubt. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the producer to call, but I know they're out there. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, that's mostly what I spend my time looking at. Yeah, well, con congrats on the book. It's pr Thank it's you. incredibly timely. Uh, I did get a call though as a reference check uh, from Brad Pitt. Uh, I guess he's 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 <laughs> the lead a lead in, Does in the. Does he want to play the customer or the data? I, I don't quite. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> for for those uh, for those watching from home who might not be familiar with CDP, can you kind of break it down for us? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's an evolution of CRM for B2C, basically. But but what it does, it, it's simple to describe. It takes customer data, and it's, as the name would imply, so information related to customers or prospects that's sitting in all kinds of different applications today. These could be email systems or social or mobile or analytics. And... Uh, information around the same customer that's in 10, 20, 30 different places. And it sort of imports it, organizes it around identities, harmonizes it so that all the rows and columns line up and makes it available for things like analysts who want to do segmentation. So they want to know how many customers have, you know, live in Michigan and have a Bernie's Mountain Dog and have a net worth over, you know, $200,000 and so on. So all of that kind of analysis can be done more easily and more accurately if you have a complete view of the customer. So it really is plumbing. It's like a persistent database. Uh, it's easy to describe, really, really hard to do. And the problem that it's solving is the problem of disconnected customer data, basically. So that's why you know it, it appeared. That's why it's so hot. And it's not, as I said earlier, no one invented it. And I can say that, I think, Honestly, no one went into a basement and invented anything new, but it has it is just a steady you know step change in the evolution of this underlying technology around customer databases. You know, in I'm sure you've 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 tracked this for a long time. Aside from just the technology silos, I mean, there's actual real organizational silos that kind of get in the way of oh, yeah. of of getting this stuff together. And in in this world as you know disrupted by the pandemic and as we start to sort of reemerge or as john calls the great reemergence uh the world won't be the same way it was when we went into this and i think as as we all know com customers have become digital first as a matter of necessity and as a result that sort of becomes uh, an ongoing standard for engagement so the need for organizational and data transformation and digital transformation is 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 urgent so uh, not only is your book timely, the conversation about this data integration uh, has to elevate, I think, within the organization because we talk about personalization, we talk about omni-channel, opti-channel, uh, you know, the customer's in control of their experience. That much we've learned. Uh, in fact, one, one interesting stat is that 75% of customers in this last year have tried a competitive brand and 75 to 83% of them are going to stick with that brand. And so there's got to be reasons why. Uh, and I have to imagine that data to know our customers and to deliver better, more personal, more intuitive experiences is, is, is critical. But we're also at this intersection. I know this is a long ramp up, but I, I want people to follow along with the context of this. Uh, we're, we're, at, we're at this place too, where CDP has become an, a, a big deal, but also we're losing the ability to have cookies, for example, to track uh, activity. Uh, and we have third-party data platforms emerging all over the place. So what what is it that, let's, let's say, decision makers need to think about? You know, What's changing now? Uh, and what do we need to consider to be successful here all, basically immediately? Yeah. Now, there's a lot going on, as you alluded to. It's not simply 
marketers woke up and realized that their customer data was all over the place. Um, this is a function of the way marketing is done. It has to do with consumers and consumers are very hard to predict. So they, they adopt, they all of a sudden, everyone decides they need an iPhone. So then you need a mobile practice and people decide that they're gonna listen to influencers. So all of a sudden I need an influencer team. And <laughs> marketers, we can't predict this stuff. You know, it comes, it just happens. There you go. That's an excellent book. I recommend that for your holiday <laughs> giving needs. But, um, uh, a lot going on. You mentioned cookie deprecation. That's very real. There's regulatory changes. There's a lot of very stringent regulatory requirements, not just in Europe. Consumer attitudes are changing. We've never been more aware as consumers of how our data is collected, how it's used, you know, what it's used for, uh, whether it's worth it giving up information for what I'm getting in return. Um, there's also in, uh, changes in the underlying technology. So there's a migration like MarTech, SaaS is very important, but also a lot of customers on the B2B side and MarTech vendors and ad tech vendors have migrated to public cloud. So this tech tech keeps evolving as well. So everything, literally everything is changing. It's regulations, it's consumer attitudes, it's technology and and the pandemic accelerated digitization. So digital's now, it was always important and now it's really important. And um, the importance of first party data cannot be overstated. So even companies like consumer products companies, um, companies that sell commodities who in the past haven't had any real data around customers at all. They sell through say retailers. Uh, so they sell through distributors and they're just a brand. They need, they want one-to-one -one relationships. They want first party data. And so that's why we're being asked all the time, you know, sign up for this, sign up for that, give me your email, even if I'm not a customer. And then many, many large consumer brands are exploring going direct to consumer, even brands where it's um, uh, not not even legal today. So they're looking at markets where it might be legal, like in the alcohol beverage market. Can I go direct to consumer in certain countries? So all of this is happening. And I think it's uh, it's the reality that the, com the companies that will win that are competitive in future are those that have the most information about customers and they need to compete with very large retailers, very large ecosystems that have a lot of information. And I think I don't even need to name them, but you know, just think of Amazon. What does Amazon know? If I'm a startup retailer, I need to compete with that experience. And to do that, I need first party data. So people are getting their act together and they're, amp they're kind of ramping up and amping up their tech. And that's why you know companies like Salesforce appear to offer packaged software to help companies do what, you know, what, what Amazon does and, and others. Yeah, thank you for that overview, Marty. And that's, I, I definitely think that sets the stage for the importance of what needs to happen next. And uh, John, I'm just gonna ask one one last question, turn it over to you. Uh, the idea that, <clears throat> you know, I see it's, it's not just a matter of aggregating data. I think it's also, of course, the insights that you can extract from data and, and the implementation of those of those insights. But, but also I think it's a mindset thing that I'd love to hear your thoughts on in, in that, for example, with with new regulations on data collection and, and implementation, uh, this is sort of an opportunity I think that brands have to to reestablish a social contract with customers. Uh, for example, I've I've always been pleasantly surprised when I learn. Uh, when, when I try to find out where that creepy line is uh, from the yeah. consumer's perspective. And it turns out that they're willing to share a lot more than we think uh, if they know that they're going to get these types of experiences. And so when we when it comes to saying, you know, are you okay with collecting this data? I'm always surprised that we don't see more of, here's what you're gonna get at, uh, in exchange for this, so that it becomes a social contract that is, uh, uh, beneficial, mutually beneficial, I should say, in, in establishing customer relationships. So the the question I have, and then John take over from here is what what is it that that marketers or CX leaders need to think differently about as we move into this new world with you know, data centricity? The there's something called the privacy paradox, which I've I've read about and it's been written about a lot, but it is it's um it makes intuitive sense. We as consumers are not very good at predicting what a personalized relevant experience will be until we've had it. So when we're asked to opt into an experience before we've had it, we're not good at making that trade-off. And so most people will opt out. They'll be like, 
you know, do you, will you opt in for to tracking, which is <laughs> nobody wants anyway, but would you opt into that, you know, in exchange for more relevant offers or something? We, we as consumers would think, well, well, no, I'm not going to do that. And that, that paradox is real. And the only way around that is to, in a sense, provide the relevance, sort of prove the relevance first, and then ask for the opt-in. Or to ask for the opt-in, get a no, provide the relevance, and then ask for the opt-in again. So if you can get a, a second chance, like a redo. So there's a lot of testing going on now in sort of how and when and what language to use to try to help people see the value of something that they actually do want, which is a more personalized, relevant experience. Um, you know, the last point I'll make around this is if you want totally untargeted advertising, for instance, just stay up late and scroll through cable television. And you'll see a lot of ads for, you know, uh, <laughs> refinancing, you know, pharmaceuticals that you are, have not, you know, no need for <laughs> random advertising. And that's what you'll get in the world of no tracking at all. And is that a better world really than stuff that you actually might buy? I, I don't know. You know, I would probably say no. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. Uh, John, over to you. So, Marty, I'm curious about the current state of the art in terms of the application of AI to all of this data, because, you know, we're, we're kind of five minutes into the AI movie and uh, collecting the data is obviously essential. But being really smart about how to develop uh, the um, the AI, um, especially with regard to, uh, you know, the sort of deep learning genre of AI uh, becomes really relevant. So. What, what's the state of the art? How sophisticated are people? Where's the innovation happening? And, and that's a lead into question number two. Well, I'll say, you know, having dabbled a, a tad in data science myself and admired, you know, people who are really good at it, um, th there's a lot of very smart data scientists, some of which are targeted at the marketing problems and marketing use cases. But in, in reality, in the day-to-day -day work of marketers, AI is really just very nascent. Um, there are, in two areas, there's, there's some good development. One is around seg doing better segmentation, so more sophisticated uh, clustering using machine learning models. So the the old days of four or five different customer segments that I applied across every campaign I did as a marketer are pretty much over. Most most companies today, with any sophistication, will have you know more nuanced segments. And then the other areas in predict in um, predictive modeling. So next best offer, next best action, or slightly personalized experience. A lot of which is enabled by software tools. You know, things mm -hmm. that are built into whatever platform you're using might be site personalization, the personalization platform on a website or in a mobile app or even in email, email providers like, um, well, Salesforce Journey Builder, for example. But there, there is some built in what I would call basic machine learning, not really even AI per se, mm -hmm. that's being used day to day in a lot of marketing workflows. Now, um, that said, the most advanced marketers have teams of, of data scientists that they've hired on usually in the last four or five years, so fairly recently, who have set up their own pipelines and are looking at raw data and are building their own models, usually for segmentation and prediction. And some of those teams can be really very advanced. So some of the product recommendations you get with re really good retailers are really quite advanced. But uh, as you said, it's early days. And, and AI, the, the whole area of kind of content creation and image recognition and um, natural language, the use of natural language and content, all of that has got a lot of room to grow, to so improve, expect, I'll say. Like, yeah, I mean, if we, yeah, if we look uh, like five years out, which in AI terms is probably, you know, 30 years out yeah. in normal uh, years, uh, what do you expect the biggest impact of um, more sophisticated data science is going to be on marketing because it it can't just yeah. be about uh, slightly more precise personal recommendations. I mean, there's got to be more disruptive applications than um, we might um, imagine right now. So, what would well, you today, no, I think today, you know, the real bottleneck is is creative, and I say that in a good way. It's like people are still needed to come up with images and text and creative ideas and campaigns and uh, if you want 56 different versions of a headline someone usually has to sit down and write 56 different headlines which creatives you know don't like doing and they're kind of treated like machines i think that as time goes on it's already kind of happening but machines are getting better at at creating versions 
of things. Mm -hmm. So the, the human might come up with the concept, the overall look and feel, and then the machine will come up with the 56 passable headlines, you know, that, that are in English that can be read by humans, and then they can be optimized by the machine. So I think that whole creative generate in images as well, it has yet to really get going, but there's a lot of potential there. So, um, you know, there there is an argument to be made that with companies like Amazon in particular, but others uh, getting more and more proficient at managing data and, you know, hiring thousands of data scientists in the case of Amazon, yeah. that the balance of power between uh, companies that are trying to sell you stuff and uh, each of us as citizens and consumers is wildly out of whack. Uh, and that, um, uh, first of all, that AI by surrounding you with an algorithm that ports to understand you might actually limit your choices because it's feeding you what it thinks you want, just like all the pop-ups uh, you know, on your phone or on your browser um, are keyed to the fact that you bought a sweater from Nordstrom's last week. And so they're going to offer you 10 more products uh, in that genre as opposed to expanding your uh, view of things. So there's one aspect, which is limitation, but there are others which are about you could almost say the potential for manipulation because um, I'm sure that shopping addiction has become a much bigger deal in the era of Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. Precision of offers, you know, uh, leads to one click, leads to, you know, your credit card being overused. Um, so uh, what, what, what are your thoughts about that balance of power? I mean, there's a lot of talk about consumers managing their data and monetizing their data and, and being empowered and all this stuff. But I, I don't see much to suggest that people are taking advantage of that or that, you know, it's really been uh, reduced to practice in an interesting kind of way. So how do we get balance and avoid being manipulated by big companies? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know the answer. I do agree with you, and I'll give you a quick example. I went to um, the other day, as many of us did in pandemic. I went to Tesla, and I was looking at the site, and I configured my Tesla, and it got the right color, the right model, and then there was a button at the end of it that said "Buy Now," and I said, "It can't be that easy." And in fact, if I'd hit the button, it would have arrived on my doorstep. So I wouldn't even need to touch a Tesla. It would just appear magically. And my wife is like, don't hit the button twice. <laughs> so I didn't end up buying one, but it's you know frictionless experience. And that kind of thing does, I think, encourage purchase. That's the whole point of it. I think that it is uh, incumbent on us as consumers to raise our awareness and to kind of train ourselves not to give in to that. We, we need to be aware of how we're being manipulated. Uh, there, there may be software checks to that, but I, I don't see anyone, um, even a, uh, you know, in a regulatory way, going to a company like Amazon and saying you've got to, you've got to diminish the power of your recommendations. I don't see that happening. It has to be up to consumers. Well, but on the other hand, you know, the the you know, H. L. Mencken said the masses are asses, and I, I don't subscribe <laughs> to that. But you know, the level of sophistication around protecting your consumer rights or um, you know, uh, exerting good judgment. I mean, if, if that were the case, we wouldn't have, you know, the amount of, uh, you know, kind of uh, shopping addiction and drug abuse and all, all the other yeah. social problems we have. So um, it seems to me that somebody or some mechanism has to be found to be advocates for citizens in, in all of this. And I'm well, just part, sure. part of the part of the privacy discussion is is for that reason. It's uh, in in, uh, in Europe, the argument about, you know, third party cookie deprecation or why we don't want to be tracked by um, that tech ecosystem is that it can encourage, you know, people to do things they don't want to do. They're being manipulated in essence. So it's influence engineering. And so the government needs to step in and say, you know, you have to opt in if, if you want to. Uh, people to gather information about you need to agree. So it's your, you know, your conscious right as a citizen to agree to this kind of data collection, we'll say. And that uh, the part of the impetus there is not just like a big brother-esque idea of someone's watching me, but it really is the fact that people who have data can manipulate consumers. And so I think that the the uh, future world of privacy, the post cookie world in a way will be one where there's a lot more opting in and there's a lot more awareness of data that's being collected. So probably the kind of manipulation that you're talking about will be less easy, at least well, um, it, that's the idea. I mean, well, there are powerful incentives to do that manipulation and we're seeing that in oh, the yeah. political arena, right? I mean, so, you know, it might well be that 
you know, if you analyze the pattern of books you buy on uh, on Amazon, you'll be more susceptible to certain kind of disinformation. And that's when the, you know, kind of consumer databases and the political databases merge on the part of maybe quasi ethical, you know, data management and analytics companies. And then we're going to be in real trouble, it seems to me. But without you know, a doubt. No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was the fear behind Cambridge Analytica. They're like, well, right. the Facebook algorithm can can uh, psychographically profile me and put me into a certain group and then show me the ad that will be most likely to, to you know, manipulate me. All of that is no doubt being researched by the less, less ethical marketers out there. Right. Yeah. Uh, and not not only researched, but uh, actually uh, <laughs> put into practice. Put into practice, yeah. Uh, and 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 uh, on on that positive note. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, if to put it in perspective here, there's there's a lot of data showing that ads have a very marginal impact on thing big decisions like who I vote for, and really? uh, so the power of marketing to change us, change our behavior, is not as great as people think. And I, I say that as a marketer. More, I'd be fascinated to know more about that research. Um, that that actually is quite reassuring. It is. It is reassuring. Yeah. It's not as scary as we think. Yeah. <laughs> At least not not now. <laughs> You're right. Right. Yeah, Brian. Over back to you. Yeah, I actually I I am with all of my might not trying to answer another question because I were asking another question because that is such a fascinating topic. Um, so Marty, we'll have to bring you back because uh, that that Please. is super yeah, that's, that's a, it's a good topic. And not just around elections, just in general. In influence. general, yeah. Well, and also then what what constitutes the type of positive behavior change uh, where you know it's additive to someone's life. Uh, and so I'm I'm a hopeless optimist, so I'd love to take it from a, a positive standpoint. So Marty, thank you so much. Congratulations on the new book, uh, and I'll see you back in the uh, the virtual office. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks, John. Thanks, Brian. That's yeah, uh, our pleasure. Uh, let's see. So now. Uh, as I learn how to use all of these buttons, uh, Gregarious, if you're listening, I miss you. We 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 uh, we hope <laughs> we hope you're having a good uh, a good speech today. But you are the glue that holds the show together. Uh, so with that said, John, our our next guest is backstage, and uh, would you like to do the honors of introducing her? Absolutely. Uh, I'm I'm excited to uh, introduce Adrienne Phillips, uh, who I think is going to bring a very unique and practice based experience to the question of. Uh, the military transition process, which is a proxy in a sense for transition processes of all kinds. Uh, she brings a lot of um, lived experience to this. She's a U.S. Air Force uh, veteran uh, herself, uh, describes herself as a combat service uh, member, uh, and currently uh, is the founder of something called the Strategic Alliance for Veteran Integration, or SAVI, which is a nice uh, acronym for sure. Um, and has spent a long time, by her own account, uh, over a decade, looking at the whole question of veterans' benefits, uh, the mechanics of veterans' transitions, um, and seems to have uh, blazed a kind of an entrepreneurial trail in terms of uh, working and founding uh, multiple nonprofits and private sector companies. So uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome you to the show, Adrian. Hey, John. Hey, Brian. Great to be here. Yeah. So. I think the the reason for me that I have a particular fascination in in this uh, subject is twofold. One is that um, in general, I'm interested in the topic of upskilling, which is a general societal gap requirement, urgent agenda, it's, and so forth and so on. But I also have more than a, a passing, um, uh, I guess, history with the U.S. military in terms of advisory work, and um, uh, am very mindful of the quality of the people in service. The uh, um, capacities they develop, uh, both what they bring into uniform service and what they acquire there, uh, and at the same time, how different the cultures are between the uniformed military and the uh, c civilian world. And, you know, uh, uh, I did a little bit of statistical homework. There are something like 19 million uh, veterans uh, in the U.S. population. It's almost 10, well, it's not 10 percent, but it's a big it's a big number, put it that way. Absolutely. And every year, uh, 200,000 uh, roughly uh, veterans or people in uniform service make the transition to civilian life, which if you uh, look at that from a um, workforce point of view, you know, the U.S. military is about 1.4 million people in uniform service. That's one out of seven people uh, transition every year, which, you know, even by, by private sector standards, that's a lot. You know, that's a that's kind of built in attrition and so forth and so on. So 
So, Adrian, I mean, at the 10,000 foot level, what's going on uh, with veterans transition um, uh, as a uh, kind of a social bridge? What are the gaps? Uh, what are you most interested in advancing? And then we can kind of dig into it from there. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for that question. So looking at the military transition process, it's really fascinating to just understand the fact that going from military culture to civilian culture, it's not like going from McDonald's to Burger King. It's an entire life transformation for our military veterans. It's a loss of identity. It's a loss of community. They're really having to redefine themselves now, taking that next step into a potential new career. Maybe they're pursuing education. Maybe they want to start a business. And there are a lot of incredible resources that exist in the marketplace. We actually have about 600,000 different resources available to military veterans between federal, state, and local level. So one of the biggest issues that I see is that it's a bit of the fire hose effect of information. So we have all of these incredible resources that exist out there, but a very narrow time frame in which they can ultimately receive education and training about how those resources apply to their specific circumstances, their life needs, their family dynamics, and ultimately what they want to do once they get out, which is not a fundamental question that most military veterans get asked. You know, you serve in the military and your primary job is to make sure that you are um, fulfilling the mission, doing the job that you are set to do. So nobody asks you, you know, what is it that you want to be when you grow up? What are your dreams and hopes? And so we look at the fact that military members serve in service and specifically our retirees who have over 20 years of military service, that's a long time to have a specific cultural mindset to really have the discipline, the training, the structure that the military provides. And then you go into the civilian sector where it's a bit of the wild, wild west of opportunities, right? You can do anything, you can be anyone. And going through that process is a very difficult uh, thing to wrap your head around, especially when there's a very narrow time frame in which you can actually do it. There's a program through the Department Department of Defense called the Transition Assistance Program, which is intended to help military veterans start to think about some of these questions, but it is primarily focused on employment. So they do offer resume writing, interview skills, and a very narrow scope of what some of the benefits are that they can receive from a federal level, particularly through the Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, many of them, especially right now through the pandemic, you know, it's hard to really pay attention because it's primarily online. So the retention piece of this information that's being given to them is not very high. And there's still a whole scope of other services outside of that that still they have no idea that they even exist or how to ultimately obtain them. So retention is a very serious issue with our military veterans, um, especially when they recently transitioned out of service, because asking or answering that fundamental question of what is it that you want to do is not something that a lot of them have an easy time being able to kind of shift through. So they either take the first employment opportunity that they're given, they default to what they were trained to do in the military. And sometimes that's not what they actually want to do for the rest of their lives. Um, I'm, su I'm surprised and interested to learn more about what these 600,000 resources are. I mean, not each one, but uh, sure. just generally speaking, what kind of resources are we talking about? It's, it's a broad scope, anything from healthcare resources, mental health support, there's family resources, community resources, business resources, educational resources. I mean, it's, it's such a broad range. There was actually a joint coalition that was conducted by the Department of Defense, the Department of VA, and the Department of Labor called the National Resource Directory. And that has about 228 pages worth of verified resources that are available to military veterans. And they ultimately maintain this database of all approved resources. Now that also encompasses the over about 50,000, 52,000 nonprofits that are currently serving in the veteran services space as well. And so again, overabundance of opportunity and resources, but just a, a huge lack of clarity as to how those resources pertain to the specific needs of that veteran. How, how much do you think the problem is also a reflection of the um, a gap in terms of how, let's say, career path planning, for want of a better term, happens within the military while you're in uniform. I mean, my uh, kind of uh, outsider perspective is that very often, you know, you, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're fluent in Spanish, so you get sent to Greenland. Um, and, you know, the personnel people are not necessarily uh, always known for their uh, insight. And then, you know, I'm sure uh, the number 
uh, uh, for the budget that's spent on internal training is gargantuan. But I wonder to the extent to which they actually imply career development arcs that have some relevance outside or anticipate the right. transition agenda. So what, what uh, can you give us a sense of what goes on inside the institution? Sure. So um, like I mentioned, the transition assistance program is the primary focus of really starting to answer some of those questions and to prepare the actual process to getting ready to get out. Most veterans, or I should say active duty personnel, really don't um, attend that transition assistance program until they're about six months out. And, um, you know, it's, again, very short time window to be thinking about that. In addition to the fact that they're still in military service, which is their primary job. Now, there are some additional resources, for example, through LinkedIn and things like that, that they can access at no cost. But really, the burden of responsibility about preparation for transition falls on that military member. There are resources that are external that they can tap into, whether it's directly from the Department of Defense, whether it's through some of these nonprofit organizations. And there are many nonprofits that are dedicated to the actual employment process. And they all offer a little bit of different kind of services, whether it's skills translation, you know, figuring out an assessment, a baseline assessment of what that looks like. But one of the programs that a lot of military members do know about, and they're very excited to participate in, is something called the DOD Skills Bridge Program. Now, this is an incredible opportunity, not only for military members, but for employers as well, because what it does is that it allows active duty personnel to spend up to the last six months of their military service, engaging in a third party apprenticeship program mm -hmm. with a civilian employer while they're still being paid by the military. Mm -hmm. So it's little to no cost for the employer to participate. And it really allows us to be able to bridge that gap between fully vetting the opportunity from the veteran perspective, but also from the employer perspective. It doesn't come with a guarantee of, of employment, so there's very low risk on both ends, but that transition process can start while they're still in. So they can participate in this anything from one day to 180 days. And each program and each opportunity is a little bit different, but they're all tied to an open position that that company may have at this time. So that to me is one of the uh, things that I absolutely encourage all of our program participants to get involved in and something that I feel like there's a huge lack of awareness of from an employer perspective as to how they can tap into this pool of qualified candidates and start to bridge that gap between the military transition experience and the reintegration back into the civilian sector. And what kind of companies tend to participate uh, and how, ma how many? I mean, is it thousands, tens of thousands? Oh, yes. It's, it's a very broad range. And of course, all of the large uh, organizations mostly know about this. Um, but really, for me, a focus is getting the small and medium um, uh, size organizations to get involved because it doesn't matter the size of the company. As long as they have a viable position to consider that military member for, they can ultimately tap into it. And you also have to keep in mind that military members have a broad range of experiences, everything from food services to administrative backgrounds, healthcare backgrounds, law enforcement backgrounds. You know, being in the military is very similar to the civilian sector in terms of the diversity of skills and industries that are encompassed under the Department of Defense umbrella. So it is, uh, it's open to anybody in terms of companies that are willing to participate. They just have to go through the approval process to go ahead and get that set up. So, um, you know, the, our guest uh, before you was talking a lot about the digitization of marketing and corporate processes and things like that. What What's the impact, you think, of uh, AI, data science, uh, personal identity in terms of trying to transform some of the transition uh, process? Or where well, do you I think it's leverage for changing it from where it is today? Right. Well, I can tell you that um, I, I have some uh, insights as to some companies some very large companies in tech that are currently working specifically on that in the sense of creating a bit of a map or, you know, just a, a skills map and uh, looking at what would be the end result of what the job is that they want to obtain. What is the experience, the certifications, the education that would be needed in order to be able to begin in that career? And then what does advancement look like after they're able to get, you know, set up from an initial standpoint? 
one of the biggest things with military members is that they're very used to having a clear path forward. You know, when it comes to rank, they know exactly what they need to do to go ahead and achieve that next rank. In the civilian sector, sometimes it's not as clearly laid out as it is in the military. So tools like this that can ultimately create a map, track that individual, make sure that they're completing the certifications that they need, have a community-based situation in which they can engage with other individuals that already work in the industry, have that mentorship element integrated into that as well can definitely create a much more fruitful outcome when it comes to the reintegration process. And definitely from a retention piece, it will make a world of difference because they know exactly how to move forward and what the expectation is in order to be able to achieve the ideal level or role that it is that they're looking for. And tech is definitely um, one of those industries that we highly promote because, I mean, most companies have some element in tech that are now integrated into their company process. And so encouraging to learn at them to learn how to utilize these tools, you know, whether it's virtual conferencing, whether it's database management, project management, how can they ultimately leverage A, a free education while they're still in, and then B, once they get out, the GI Bill, which is also a free education for military veterans. You know, that's one of the benefits of being a veteran is that they don't have to pay for these educational services. So they can get these certifications, they can get degrees at no cost to them, and ultimately credential themselves to be a lot more marketable and in, in, you know, in the civilian sector, despite maybe not having that expertise and background in that arena. Well, I think the topic of competency maps and um, digital bridges is a big one, and um, I, we should definitely compare notes offline on that. But I want to make sure that Brian has a um, some airtime here because I know you might have a <laughs> back end uh, time constraint. Yeah, so I'll probably be able to get uh, one question in and then uh, I'll, I'll vanish uh, and turn it back to you, John. Uh, Adrian, first, thank you. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, and also thank you for what you're doing here. You know, my grandfather uh, was uh, a veteran uh, in the Army. My, my father in the Air Force, my son, is currently in the Marines, uh, shifting into the Army uh, to move into his desired course of uh, training, which is in uh, digital intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I think most about for him, uh, and also which parallels to what, what you're working on, mm -hmm. uh, is the experience I had a, f a few years ago with uh, the Last Mile program, which was uh, a program meant to reskill uh, prisoners at San Quentin Mm -hmm. uh, started in San Quentin as a pilot, then it, it, it grew around the country to reskill them and prepare them for life after prison to have a greater chance of success. And it started as a, I was I was a, a founding mentor. And so I would uh, visit the uh, San Quentin and share my experiences, help uh, help help prisoners learn where they can grow and some of the things that they needed to learn and also unlearn. Mm -hmm. uh, and it grew into a program where they realize that the greatest opportunity after an aptitude test might be also to help give them the skills they need and not just talk about it. So for example, uh, they uh, created uh, coding courses and uh, mm -hmm. not only did they create the coding courses, they built a network of uh, employers who were ready to hire them upon completion of the program and of course on release. And so I'd love to hear from you in terms of, uh, for, for those companies who are watching, and then also any any currently enlisted uh, service members or veterans who are also watching this. What are some of the ways that companies can communicate better? Like, what are the, the skills that are in demand? You know, John, you talked about this upscaling earlier. You know, in, in some ways, it's also reskilling. There's a lot of stuff that we do today that we're not going to be doing thanks to AI and automation and RPA. Right. So what could what could companies communicate like, hey, this, these are the things that you should be focusing on. Uh, and so and so that we on the other side of this hear it and learn how to plan or better, uh, as, as, I guess, invest in ourselves for this future right now. Right. Absolutely. Well, I think first and foremost, awareness of what the opportunities are is going to be key. You know, a lot of employers say that they are veteran friendly or that they're looking to target more veterans and bring them on staff. But my question is, what does that actually mean? Like, what is the commitment to that process to actually position yourself in the marketplace mm -hmm. as a veteran friendly employer? Now, there's a couple of things that I would definitely recommend. Uh, first and foremost, you need to go where the military members are. So get involved with some of these service organizations 
organizations get involved with some of these Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups. There's plenty of platforms that definitely attract military members. Um, and I will say particularly Lincoln is something that is highly promoted um, in the military transition process because they do get access to LinkedIn Premium for one year for free. Mm -hmm. And so just knowing that these military members are positioning their profiles to state transitioning military, you know, looking for career opportunities in X, Y, and Z. And so starting to target from an outreach perspective, these individuals and letting them know about your company, letting them know about the opportunities that exist within the company. A lot of this is just a lack of awareness. You know, they may think of, I don't know, Walmart or Amazon or whoever it is, and they may have a very narrow understanding as to what the job roles are that they can actually move into. And so just bringing awareness as to the opportunities would definitely be step one. Secondly, have a dedicated page or content that is veteran focused. You know, a lot of times veterans will type into Google search, you know, veteran friendly employers or, you know, veteran jobs or whatever it is. And if there's nothing that pops up online to indicate that that company is either targeting veterans, is military friendly, or anything along those lines. And that can be absolutely a missed opportunity, both for the employer and for the veteran, because now there's no way for that veteran to identify that that organization is actually targeting somebody like them. Uh, the next thing that I would say is, again, the DOD Skills Bridge Program. I can't emphasize enough how incredible of an opportunity that is for both ends, for the employer and for the veteran, to be able to fully vet the opportunity with very low risk. There is no commitment to employment there. And it really allows that transition process to start early. And then lastly, I would say is just once you onboard a military veteran, make sure that your environment is friendly to some of the things that they're used to when it comes to structure, when it comes to clear communication, when it comes to mentorship, when it comes to having a clear path forward. What does advancement look like? So what is the expectations of the job role? What are the things that they're going to be required to do every single day within their position so that they can be effective and that they can actually feel like they're succeeding. Communication is absolutely key. Don't assume that veterans know anything. And then the last piece of this that I just wanted to mention as a caveat is reasonable accommodations. A lot of our military members, not all, do have some level of disabilities. Reasonable accommodation is not a term that is used in the military. You know, it's pretty much drink water, press on. You suck it up, you don't complain about anything. But sometimes that disability may create a limitation to the point where A, the veteran is not going to ask for help. We're not taught to ask or complain about anything. And so there may be many instances in the veteran will actually quit because they feel like they're failing. And it really could be something as simple as a fix because of a reasonable accommodation. So working with HR, introducing them to the process, letting them know that that's there for them in case they ever need it. Um, just bringing that awareness again, that there are supplemental support services like reasonable accommodations that can certainly help them be successful within that next career. It's almost like uh, some kind of a cultural uh, dictionary or translation uh, um, uh, document uh, should be standard issue on both sides of the equation. Um, and it, it shouldn't be that hard to really, uh, um, you know, kind of create the equivalencies when when they say this, they mean that and so right. forth and so on. But right. we'll leave that to the cultural anthropologists, <laughs> I guess, to uh, handle. So um, I'm curious, just in at a, at a very um, sort of... 10,000 foot level, if you could wave a magic wand and change one or two things about how it works right now, mm -hmm. uh, what would you change? And how does that relate to the savvy and to the other work that you're doing? Well, uh, how we've had to change is really what we've implemented into our program. So first and foremost, we um, our eligibility starts at one year pre-separation. And even then, sometimes it feels like it's not enough time. So getting these military members to start thinking about the transition process early is absolutely key because there's a lot of um, micro decisions that they need to make that are going to impact the process that if they wait until the last minute, they're going to be making impulsive decisions that it may potentially cost them in the long run. So having that preparatory period as early as possible is absolutely essential. The second thing that um, is, is going to be, you know, a life changer is going to be customization. First and foremost, transition does not mean employment. So many organizations tend to say, well, they're transitioning, let's get them a job and they're good to go. There are so many elements outside of the employment process that impact transition and that can absolutely either create a successful reintegration or a not so successful reintegration. So 
looking at all of the other parameters outside just employment and really customizing and tailoring the resources to the individual, again, is going to make a world of difference. And that's exactly those what we Those parameters being what? I mean, what are some examples beyond the... So, like I said, like life insurance considerations, uh -huh. family dynamics, access to health care. Are they going to buy? Are they going to rent? What are they going to wear to work every day? Um, what is their community support look like if they're going to be relocating to another area? What are some of the organizations that they can connect with locally, um, you know, educational access, whether it's for them or for their dependents, you know, what are the options that they have in that arena? The list goes on. It, you're, you're essentially transforming your entire life. So anything that can impact your finances, that can impact your health, that can impact your family, these are all going to be areas of consideration outside of just the employment piece. And some That's veterans cool. are not looking for a job. Some of them are looking yeah. to go into school full time. Some of them are looking to start a business. And so how do we customize resources and support mechanisms around that process that may not fit the cookie cutter, let me get my next job? I mean, it seems like a golden opportunity for some kind of uh, self-assessment, life planning, getting right. into the deeper you know, pillars of leading a good life Absolutely. Um, uh, and injecting that into the, uh, the pro life skills, you know, which Absolutely. you know are, are lacking everywhere. I mean, not just uh, um, sure. you know in terms of the planning process for people getting out of the military. Uh, and do those kind of programs exist? I mean, would you say yeah. that there are? Yes, our, our program exists. Your program, That's exactly okay. how we structured our program. Okay. So what we do is that we offer a 12 month program where we meet with our vets every four to six weeks through their entire transition process. Our primary focus is to educate them on all of their federal benefits. And then our secondary focus is to customize all of these incredible resources to help it match and fit their primary objective. Whether that's an education, entrepreneurship, retirement or employment, it can be a combination of all four it can be three, it can be two, but we're really diving deep into the questions that are going to be essential that are directly linked to support services and helping them create a custom transition plan with an accountability process, with a sounding board for them to direct their question to, and on the basis that everything is customized to their needs. It is not a one size fits all. We're never going to give them a checklist with a whole bunch of phone numbers to call and tell them, good luck, you know, figure it out, which is typically the process currently. So that's what we have dedicated ourselves to in terms of program um, that we offer right now and everything that we provide for veterans is absolutely free and anything that we refer them to is absolutely free. Well, uh, you know, I could uh, go on and on because there's so much to uh, unpack here, but we're at the bottom of the hour. So I, I recommend that uh, people in our audience check out Savvy. Um, thank you very much for this pioneering and really important work. I think it serves as an example really to other kinds of transitions that are uh, materially uh, a challenge for us in society. So I look forward to learning more about your work and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's really great to have you. Okay, okay so um, I think with that, I am going to demonstrate my ignorance in terms of how the uh, technology works here. But just to say thank you for being with us. Uh, we are working on Intersections Live and we're beginning to post the videos. We're working on the uh, newsletter. Uh, we're working for other forms of community engagement. Brian and I are actively involved in, uh, we're in the woodshed, as they say in jazz, uh, trying to figure out Intersections 2.0. So uh, stay tuned and uh, we'll see you next week. Okay, take care. Bye.